call on Government Order of the Day number two. Environment Canterbury Transitional Governance Arrangements Bill, third reading. Uh, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Dr Nick Smith. Mr Speaker, I move that the Environment Canterbury Transitional Governance Arrangements Bill uh, be now read a third time. Mr Speaker, this bill provides for a sensible transition from the commissioners that the government installed uh, in Environment Canterbury back in 2010. It provides for a mix uh, of both elected representatives and continuity of commissioners uh, through to 2019, from when the council will move to full elections. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government is very proud of the work and of the tough calls we made in terms of getting Environment Canterbury into a far better shape to be able to deal with the huge challenges of managing fresh water in Canterbury, of dealing with the rebuild issues uh, in that region, and taking one of New Zealand's worst performers in the local government sector up to being one of the very best. Mr Speaker, uh, it would be uncharitable of me or Louise Upston and the other ministers that I've worked with to claim the credit for the success of the work out of Environment Canterbury because it very much rests with the very skilled commissioners who were prepared to step up to the challenge and make a difference for that region. I do want to take the opportunity in this third reading to pay tribute to Dame Margaret Baisley, who I think is one of New Zealand's most outstanding public servants, and I'm in awe of her ability to be able to deal with very complex issues, let alone with water, throwing in the complexity of the earthquake and seeing this organisation through with change. But equally so, I should pay tribute to Peter, people like Peter Skelton and a previous Environment Court judge, people like David Cagle, a former uh, Labor uh, minister, people like Tom Lambie, like Rex Williams, like David Bedford and Elizabeth Cunningham, who have far exceeded the government's expectations in terms of providing a quality of governance for this important organisation. Mr Speaker, there has been some debate about whether in October 2017 we should go cold turkey and simply remove, go to a step of full elections at that time. It is true that our government has been cautious in that regard. The first key issue for me is actually around the issue of fresh water management. The truth is the water issue in Canterbury is far bigger than any other part of the country, with over 50% of the renewable electricity produced in that region, with over 70% of all the irrigation in New Zealand done in that region, and I would also say the issues of water quality being more challenging in Canterbury than anywhere else. If we go back to 2010, when the government took the big call to intervene in Environment Canterbury, there was no water plan in place at all. There were no limits on the conversion, even though the impacts of that on water quality were significant. It was also a council that had the worst record of all 86 of our councils in terms of meeting statutory timeframes in processing resource consents. I put that in contrast to the situation today where not only in terms of processing consents, actually Environment Canterbury has moved from being one of the worst managers of water to actually being at the cutting edge internationally of how we deal with the very challenging issue of diffuse water pollution, what they've developed with the farming community around good management practices, around the red zones, around the collaborative zone committees, in my view, has set a very strong foundation, not just for Canterbury in terms of fresh water management, but indeed uh, for New Zealand. I'd also make the contrast that in 2010, and I know this has been important for my colleague Louise Upston, 
every one of the 10 mayors in Canterbury asked the government to intervene, to sack the council and to put the commissioners in place. And it's so interesting for us today, the rebuild in the relationships, where every one of those councils are acknowledging that the commissioners have a far better relationship with Environment Canterbury, and getting the two units of local government working together has been absolutely critical in terms of the scale of challenges that region has passed, in terms of the earthquakes. And I'd also say that the very strong feedback I've had from Naitahu is that the relationships between ECAN and Iwi in the region are consequentially so much stronger. Mr Speaker, the model that we have chosen in going forward is for there to be a majority of elected councillors from October this year, four from the City of Christchurch and one each from North Canterbury, from South Canterbury and from Mid Canterbury. We are then saying that through to 2017 it will move over to a standard council. The question around why not go just cold turkey is actually the expertise of the commissioners to being able to ensure that that good work is completed. Let me tell you how important it is. We do, thank goodness, now have a Canterbury Water Plan, a plan that is regulatory, that is operative across the full region. What we don't yet have is operative zone plans for each of the can catchments across Canterbury. An enormous amount of work has gone on with those home committees. The government wants to bank, wants to back the continuity and that momentum so that that piece of work is completed by 2019. And that is why we are maintaining both the limited appeal rights and the work of the commissioners uh, through to that process. Mr Speaker, I've heard all sorts of exaggerated rhetoric from members opposite around democracy. I simply challenge members opposite, challenge members opposite, and to say, what about when Helen Clark displaced the Auckland District Health Board? What about when the last Labor government sacked the council in Rodney? In both cases, members on this side of the House actually said there's a strong case and actually good ministers, good governments will see problems where they exist and will address them rather than sort of standing on this notion that we will never intervene. The truth is, the government's intervention in Canterbury has been necessary. It's been necessary. It has made a huge difference. And actually what is provided for in this bill, in a plan that's been worked together by myself and my colleague Louise Upston, provides for a sensible transition so that we do not have instability at such a crucial time in the history of not just the earthquake issues, but the water issues in Canterbury. Mr Speaker, I thank uh, members such as those uh, from the Māori Party uh, who are supporting this bill. They are putting the interests of Canterbury ahead of cheap politics. They are assuring that we are keeping this good work on track. And the people of Canterbury, the water of Canterbury, the rebuild of Canterbury will be better for the practical measures that is in this bill. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Ruth Dyer.